were, it's, it's interesting we were just talking during the break about uh, Thomas Edison and the fact that the companies were called, for example, Edison Electric. He didn't own them, but one of his major fights early on was Edison was a genuine populist. He wanted everybody to have access to power. And so Edison uh, insisted on central generating stations so that everybody could have electricity. One of the arguments early on had been that by financiers that you could have a very profitable company that just made individual generating stations for factories and for rich people so you would have bought your own small generating plant. And there was a very serious de debate for a few years about which way to go and Edison was adamantly in favor of large central generating stations that would allow everybody to have access to electricity and, and he was a genuine populist. L let me uh, explain, somebody asked me during the break what happened to some of these attitudes and ideas which I think if you were to look at America from uh, really its founding up through uh, the beginning of the Depression clearly was a dominant attitude and remained, I think, the preeminent attitude till 1965, gradually being undermined to some extent, but was, was, was in, in many ways still the, the, the preeminent attitude until 1965, and then broke down. And what I would suggest to you is that the spirit of invention and discovery is undermined by seven welfare state cripplers of progress. There are seven things the welfare state does to cripple progress. Credentialism, bureaucratism, we're going to go back through these in a minute, taxation, litigation, centralization, an anti-progress cultural attitude and just plain ignorance. Let me walk you through this for a second. The first is credentialism. What did it take to be an inventor or a discoverer? It took inventing and discovering. I mean, it's very interesting that Bill Gates dropped out of college, that the founder of Apple Computers dropped out of college. I mean, the fact is, a lot of great entrepreneurial inventors and discoverers just go do it. I mentioned the other week uh, the, the, the author of T-Rex, the, 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 one of the leading dinosaur uh, or paleont vertebrate paleontologists in the country, was a college dropout. But, he, uh, he, but he's interested in dinosaurs. I mean, he wasn't interested in learning all the other junk you have to learn to get out. He was interested in learning about dinosaurs, which he learned a lot about. He's now a world authority. And the reason I start from here is that in an earlier era, if you could do it, we had this discussion this week, in fact. We had ten street salvation specialists. These are people who help drug addicts, they help alcoholics, they help prostitutes, they help teen gangs. None of them have a college degree. Many of them are former addicts themselves and they're making the point that in the modern bureaucratic age they are being asked by the government to hire somebody who has the right masters in social work who knows nothing about the street because the people they are hiring are all ex-addicts from the street who have no degrees. So even though they're doing a wonderful job, they're saving people, and they, they have much higher salvation rates in terms of, of drug addiction and alcoholism than do the, the traditional government programs, sometimes as much as ten times as high. But they don't have any degrees, therefore they can't really be good people. So the state says we have to hire somebody who's graduated from college, and this one guy said, I only hire drug addicts and street people. So it's, it's an, just a very different kind of way of thinking about it. Do you measure what people can accomplish, or do you remember what papers they, what piece of paper they have? The second one's bureaucratism. I, you know, I was tired earlier telling you about. Uh, I want you to think now about the Wright brothers. They walk into the Environmental Protection Agency, Orville and Wilbur, and they say, "Hi, we're we're uh, we're bicycle uh, repair people in, in uh, Ohio, and we want to uh, fly an airplane. And the best place to fly an airplane is uh, on the." Atlantic coast near Kitty Hawk where there are big sand dunes and lots of wind. Oh, sand dunes? <laughs> Just typical of those kind of Ohio industrial types, right? Don't even care. There are only about 1,500 miles of sand dunes left. And of course the first key question, have you done the endangered insect species form? <laughs> you can imagine again, these two bicycle mechanics, right? What, what endangered you know, insect? Well, you're going to have this plane. It's going to go through the air. It's going to have a propeller. It's going to hit things. How will you know whether or not you wipe out a species if you don't first check to see if there are species to be wiped out? <laughs> you can imagine going through all this stuff, right? Then they walk down the hall to OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Agency. <laughs> Have you ever seen the Wright Brothers' original flyer, which was made of, of, of spruce and muslin? It's very, very light. One person lays down flat. The reason they had to find a windy hill was they couldn't get enough power for it to fly if it, was, if it flew. That, this is how, how light it is and how underpowered it is. Can you imagine what it would have looked like if OSHA had gotten done? The sucker would never have worked. <laughs> so you couldn't have flown anywhere. You'd have had to take a train unless 
In the 1820s, George Stevenson, when he was inventing the rocket, which is the first train, had had to walk into OSHA to get their approval for a train, which means, of course, you'd ride in a stagecoach, unless during the Assyrian era there had been an OSHA which had said, wheels, you want people to ride on wheels? People should walk. God wanted them to walk. Now, you may think I'm exaggerating. I can find you books that literally outline that kind of attitude. So bureaucratism, the idea that filling out the paperwork is more important. Can you imagine filling out 50,000 failed inventions? I mean, failed uh, tests with, with Edison? Can you imagine the paperwork the modern government would want? The third big problem is taxation. Now, why is taxation a problem? Because if the central government takes away from you the resources, if Henry Ford had to work so hard and had no money left after he got done working, he couldn't have invented it, he couldn't have built his first car. You have to have after-tax income in order to have the freedom to try to do the things you want to do. And if a government takes the tax money away from you to give it to a bureaucrat, you've taken it away from the inventor and the discoverer. And so you've actually lowered the amount of resources available. Litigation. You know, we were kidding earlier, and, and somebody of you spontaneously said, when I talked about Henry Ford running over this guy in the first week, you know, where's the trial lawyer? But litigation's a major problem. High-tech companies will tell you that high taxes, raising the cost of capital to build the next factory, and litigation, particularly strike law firms that automatically sue them if their stock goes up or down, automatically sues them, that those are two major impediments to high-tech companies in America today. And that you look at the current aviation industry, Terry and I both can agree to that. The current aviation industry is so saturated with litigation yep. about incompetent well, pilots getting killed because they flew an airplane they shouldn't have been flying anyway. Light aviation is just about extinct now. Yeah, that's right. L litigation has driven uh, the production of light aircraft out of this country, to take an example. So, so litigation is a major killer of invention and discovery. Centralization. Because what happens in centralization, remember I drew earlier, it's a very important psychological model for you to think about. The more centralized you are, the more decisions will be political and obsolete. In other words, the bigger the centralized system, if you have a great idea out here, but the decisions are made right here, this is the decision point, it's inside this huge bureaucracy, you've got to somehow convince all of these layers of people that your nutty new idea is workable. 